Hello everybody and welcome back to Witch Fix. Today it's another book in the Wicker series by Kate Tiernan and this is book 11, Origins. Now the content of this one was kind of hinted at at the end of Seeker. Um, basically they found a book which was supposedly written by one of Morgan's far-flung ancestors on her father's side, uh, the evil dude called Kieran, and it purported to hold the explanation behind the origins haha, of the Dark Wave, which is a wave of demons which has been destroying covens so that woodbane covens like Amaranth can take their power. So I kind of knew picking this one up and seeing a new photograph of a new stock model on the front that maybe we were going to be going back in time and living through the eyes of Morgan's relative and that is exactly what this book is about. It is about the life and times of Rose McEwen in 1682 and the events that lead to her inventing the dark wave basically um, and all that that entails. There's a couple of differences right off the bat between this one and other books in the series. After shaking things up by making Hunter the main character of the previous novel, it just looks like the author decided to rip up the rule book and decide to change the format of the books as well as the main character. So for the first time, we don't have the pre-chapter slices of life of other characters or historic characters or other characters in the series. I kind of understand that because it's one long massive flashback essentially so putting in those other bits could have been a bit confusing uh, so I'm not particularly mad about that and also because usually I find those extracts are what I look forward to when I get to the start of a new chapter uh, reading about someone who isn't Morgan and I don't really need that in a book that isn't about Morgan. The other difference is that the book has a prologue and an epilogue. That's basically just the framing device of Morgan and Hunter sitting down to read the book. So the prologue is them starting to read it and then the epilogue is them having finished reading it. Neither of those is very long. In fact, the prologue is a lot longer than the epilogue as it's sort of like double the length page wise. That kind of annoyed me a bit because most of the epilogue was just recapping what had happened in Hunter's book, which is the previous one to this, and a lot of other stuff that had happened like previously in the series like there's a whole paragraph which is just a potted history of Morgan with Cal and it's like well we've read the other books in the series this is book 11 do us the credit of assuming that we did just pick this one up and decide oh book 11 that seems like a good starting point to start with a series they kind of waste a lot of time telling us that whereas I would have been a lot more interested to see the reactions of Morgan and Hunter to what they have learned uh, by reading essentially this book in the epilogue and we don't really get a huge amount of that but I'll get to that in chronological order. At the start of the novel we get introduced to Rose, she's the daughter of the high priestess of her Woodbane coven except it's spelled like Woadbane so I'm assuming it's like an old oldy Englishy way of saying it. They live in the Scottish Highlands, her mother's name is I think Sela and they practice in secret because there's a lot of witch huntings and witch hangings going on around where they live. Added to that, the fact that every other kind of witch, um, blood witch, seems to be prejudiced against woodbanes. There are a number of occasions in the novel where Vic Roths and I can't remember any of the other clan names, but other clan blood witches kind of cross paths with some of the woodbane characters and are very quick to kind of spit at their feet and say that they're dirty, horrible woodbanes and that they only work dark magic and everything bad is their fault. And there's sort of an underlying feeling there that basically how the other clans feel about woodbanes is how normal humans feel about witches in general, i.e. they blame them for all their misfortunes and be would be really happy if they were all dead. And also they're hugely misinformed because we see quite clearly at the beginning of the novel that Sela's coven, that is Rose's mother's coven, is not doing anything bad. In fact, they seem to be practicing the truest form of Wicca that I've actually seen anyone practice in this series. They meet up for Sabbaths, they make a few spells like a protection bottle, uh, which is bottle to protect a mill from rats and other pests and magical interference. And they do things like dancing under the maypole, they bake bread and share it for different festivals. Basically, it seems like a form of like the older kind of pagan rituals that Wicca is meant to be aping. Things that were very similar in like The Forest Wife when I read that. There's like a lot of similar undertones. What I found quite refreshing actually while reading the book is that while in other cases I've seen this kind of thing be used as an excuse to kind of hate on Christians a little bit. There isn't a lot of that in the novel. The 
characters tend to just not think about their Christian neighbours that much at all, to be honest. They are wary, they practice in secret, but there seems to be no like animosity towards them. In fact, um, Rose's mother wants to do a healing spell to help one of the Christian women, but she's afraid to because she knows that obviously she could be killed for doing that and that she regrets it because now she can't help that woman. And there's talk, especially at the beginning, by Rose when they have to go to the Christian church to keep up appearances, that all gods are one god. And so she doesn't hate the Christian god, but she does dislike his priests and the kind of fear that they're spreading across the countryside. So I felt like that was quite balanced and nuanced in a way that I had not expected it to be reading a book in this series. So that was a really pleasant surprise and I quite enjoyed that. Similarly enjoyed like all the stuff setting up Rose's life, um, the kind of rituals that they do, the way that she's learning from her mum and her mum's book of shadows, uh, the way they describe keeping their craft secret. All of that was really interesting and it was sort of building up this new world compared to the world that we're more familiar with in the Wicker series because it was talking more about the clans and how they work together and in many cases how they did not work together, how they work across purposes. Now the actual plot of the book really kicks off when Rose meets a strange young man who is apparently a leapborn, which is a kind of blood witch. It's like one of the clans and they're meant to be kind of tricksters. And I'd always kind of read the word as being very similar to leprechaun. So that's what I pictured in my head. But he's just some sort of gingery chap who shows up in the woods one day and she instantly basically falls in love with him at first sight. Having never had strong feelings towards anyone before, she meets him and she's like, this is the one. He is my insert strange Celtic word that I can't say for soulmate here. So she has a stone with her called a rose stone which she was intending to give to her friend Kira who wants to get it on with the blacksmith's lad who's also a woodbane um, but instead of giving it to Kira she uses it to make a charm to draw this man to her and the two begin like a kind of love affair in that like early hazy days of summer type way they meet up a lot even though they are obviously from rival clans and neither clan is going to be happy that they're kind of dating outside their own as it were um, we also see at various points that rose's mother has warned her against love magic and against specifically doing love magic on a specific person to alter their will uh, as that is considered to be a dark type of magic and not something that she wants her daughter to be practicing so you can kind of see how we're already setting rose up for a fall here because that's exactly what she's done but for the longest time it seems like nothing's happening like the love is very reciprocal they're getting along great uh, they're doing magic together at her like secret altar in the woods and everything seems rosy in fact he even tells her that he sees that she's destined for great things to be the high priestess of her coven and that in certain ways that she embodies the goddess and indeed at one point in one of the rituals she says that she is the goddess in like human form and at that moment she gets struck by lightning and falls down and she's not sure if this is a sign of the goddess blessing her or if it's a warning and I mean it's pretty clear if it was a warning because it hurt apparently but nevertheless she continues and she thinks that her mother is trying to keep her down not let her practice magic because her mother is afraid that she's more powerful than she is all that teenage nonsensey jazz so they continue to be in love and it's all very sickening and lovely and that goes on for a really long time um, which kind of started to bore me a bit because it fell into a pattern and a pattern is never really good to my mind because it just means that you're seeing the same scenes over and over again they meet up in the woods they declare their love they do some magical stuff she goes home then rinse and repeat for the next couple of chapters at last uh, on Beltane Rose decides that she's going to sleep with him and basically cement their union in a way that her mother's clan and her and his clan cannot then tear apart. Uh, so they decide to sleep together. There had been a number of chapters previously that ended with a kind of like fade to black of them like romping in the moss. So I'd assume they'd already done it. But weirdly, the pagans, in inverted quote marks in this book, have like a weirdly Christian attitude towards sex. Um, her friend Kira in particular is like the source of this in the book because she says like I can't believe you know you've kissed someone you're not married to 
you know, I can't believe you're going to sleep with someone you're not married to. And then there's a lot of fuss later about, you guessed it, a baby out of wedlock. So it feels like they have very Christian values, which I felt was a little bit jarring, considering they were meant to be very different to the Christians. But there we go. Predictably, after doing it on Beltane, which is, after all, a fertility celebration, Rose becomes pregnant and is convinced that her child is the child that's going to unite the woodbanes and the leapforns. I nearly said leprechauns. They're not leprechauns. I need to make that very clear. However, after that, like, one magical night, he goes suspiciously missing for a while. And Rose starts to panic because she's actually lost the rose stone that she had originally and is starting to wonder if maybe the magic is gone, like, her, as her charm is gone. What if that was the only thing that was like binding them together and she's like no of course not he loves me it's all fine and then like a week later she gets a letter delivered by a number member of the leap Vaughan coven and it says i have come to see that we can never be together it was foolish of me to think we could marry though i will ever think of you longingly in our special place of the forest think of me when you go there for mine eyes will never feast on that place or on you again Please, Rose, do not cry for me. There will be others for you. Perhaps a stout, hearty woodbane lad? Question mark. In the meantime, the best thing you can do is forget me. Truly, Diarmweed. I think that's how you say it. 1,000 emojis send. So basically, she gets dumped by text, but like the 1600s equivalent. And she cannot believe it. She's like, what has happened? Because he was meant to be going back to his clan to say, screw all you leprechauns. I'm going to marry a woodbane and unite our clans because our love is true and we are bonded together in the eyes of the goddess and all that stuff. At this point, I kind of started to lose a little bit more interest in the story because it was pretty clear to me what had happened. And obviously it was very tragic that he was kind of a dick and he just gotten what he wanted and was clearing off back to safer pastures where he wouldn't run the risk of earning his family's disapproval. Obviously Rose doesn't know that. Rose is stuck in a very Romeo and Juliet teen tragedy but as a reader I was like I can kind of see where this is going. A few things did pop up that then surprised me and regained my interest and that is namely that Diarmweed or just the dude as I'm going to refer to him because I can't say any of these names is uh, actually betrothed to a girl called Siobhan. I can say Siobhan. Yay! And what's worse, when uh, Rose actually ventures out to his village to kind of spy on him and find out if he's okay, she finds out that not only is he already betrothed and has been betrothed since birth to this girl called Siobhan, she is not a leprechaun. She is from the Vicroth clan, which I kind of think of as being Vikings because it has the same... For <laughs> it has the same first three letters and they're meant to be like a warlike clan so vikings obviously she's not the less pleased about this but then she continues to go down the road of thinking that all she needs to win back this dude is just a little bit of magic and to get him alone and talk to him and be like i'm having your baby we need to get married and i can kind of see how this isn't going to work because at this point he just kind of seems like a, a pretty weak willed twerp to be honest and it was kind of obvious that it wasn't going to go her way. But she persists, nevertheless. She does a few uh, magic love spells in the vein of the ones her mum told her not to do. And then tries to approach him again and tells him the news about the baby. And he seems delighted. He's all ready to get married and go off with her into the sunset. And then he says, I'll meet you in our special place in the woods by sundown. Go and wait for me there. And I'm like... Bitch, if you walk away from this guy, if you let this guy out of your sight, you are never going to see him again because that's the 10 million miles of bad road being signalled. But she does and she goes and waits in the clearing and she falls asleep, wakes up in the dark and he is not there. And then when she is on her way back to her house, confused and upset, who should rock up but Siobhan, who is described as having a long swan-like neck and all I could picture was like some weird like you know in The Simpsons when everyone thinks that there's an alien but it's actually Mr. Burns and he's all glowy and he's walking around with like a really long neck kind of ooh, through the woods. That's all like a picture at that point which is completely on me and not really a comment on the book but it added humour to the proceedings. Siobhan is basically like stay away from my man because I'm a viking and I'll slit you up and Rose is all like our love is eternal. I'm pregnant with his child. What are you talking about? 
and Siobhan reveals that Rose is not the first person that he has had dalliances with and that he's actually been getting his end away all up and down the country but Siobhan for some reason still wants to marry him because I guess she's just mean um, and also you know political clan relation type stuff but this really is just kicking Rose when she's down so she gets a little bit pissed off and she decides to try and do a curse on Siobhan it's not a particularly big or serious curse. Uh, Siobhan, in the meantime, has done a spell to fill Rose's cottage with frogs. So Rose responds by sending a spell that will cause um, Siobhan's lovely long blonde hair to become tangled and full of thorns and really horrible and unattractive. Because apparently that's the best she can think of. And I think that's nice because it kind of shows that Rose isn't evil. She's basically doing like a practical joke on this girl. It's basically the equivalent of going up to her car and scraping it with her key, if they had had either of those things. So she does the spell. They go, stupidly, her, her friend and her friend's new squeeze, go to the village to kind of watch Siobhan get her comeuppance. Siobhan sees them. And when they get back to the village, it's for Rose to discover that an unknown and unseen hunter accidentally, and I'm doing quote marks, which you can't see, but imagine, shot her mum in the back with an arrow and when the arrow is removed it has the Vicroth's runes on it so it's pretty clear that this is a message being sent maybe it was a failed attack on Rose we don't know. Rose is having none of this so after she's tried to take care of her mum uh, she decides to do a spell uh, to cause Siobhan to basically slip into a coma, a near death like state, and be forced through a kind of weird vision quest so that she can only wake up when she's learned her lesson. And again, this is slightly more evil than tangling her hair, but it's not lethal. It's she doesn't want to like necessarily kill anyone. She just wants to scare them and prove her point. So even though someone attempted to murder her mum, Rose is not necessarily trying to kill anyone, which I think bears noting. She bottles up this potion that she's made. She takes it to the village. She gives it to one of Siobhan's brothers and says to give it to Siobhan because it's a present from the dude with the incomprehensible name. And sure enough, later on, she hears that actually the little brother decided to open the potion and take a drink. And he's now in a coma and Siobhan's spitting mad. So everything's going downhill. And at this point, I felt like we were in another pattern. There was a lot of Rose going to this village, talking to the dude, talking to Siobhan. There were a lot of spells going backwards and forwards. And it was just kind of settling again into a, a pattern. It felt like we were spending too long on this stage of the story. Fortunately, at that point, something else came along, which changed things up quite a bit. One, Rose found out that the only reason that the spell had been broken on the dude, like the second spell that she'd done with some poppets, was because her mum had found the poppets and untied them because she didn't want her doing that kind of magic. So she gets kind of pissed off at her mum. And also, that next evening, Siobhan shows up with the village vicar in tow and points at Rose and is like, that's her, that's the witch. So Rose gets accused of witchcraft, which I think everyone saw coming because if you're in a puritanical town and you're a girl in a novel, you're going to get accused of witchcraft, whether you are a witch or not. And to be honest, no one has really been like they say they practice in secret, but they talk quite loudly about witchcraft and they practice a lot of just in the woods where other people go. So I was waiting for someone to get caught. Now, at this point, I was I'm not feeling particularly well disposed towards Rose like I could understand her plight but at the same time I thought she'd been quite naive and stupid so my sympathy was limited but at this point there was a scene that really made me feel for her quite strongly because they put her on trial in the village square and Siobhan is there and a load of other witches and people are saying like like death to the woodbane but apparently so only she can hear and then Siobhan says she's pregnant with the devil's baby and I saw her making love with the devil in the woods. And it's revealed that she's pregnant out of wedlock, which is obviously a no-no as far as the Christians are concerned. So she seems to be kind of up shit creek. And all this time she's sending like frantic witch messages to the dude because she can see him in the crowd. And she's like, are you here to save me? Please save me. I'm carrying your baby. Don't let it die. Just, just do something. Be a man. And... She says, no, my baby has a human father. And the reverend is like, if that's true, who is it? And she has enough loyalty left in her to the dude to not 
point at him in the crowd and go, that's him, that's the fecker. But she sends him another witch message, like a mental communication, being like, you have to say something. You have to save me because they are going to kill me. And he does nothing. And at that point, I was like, I feel really sorry for you again. Like, this has tipped me back over the edge into empathy. At this point, I'm just going to yank on the reins just a little bit and give a trigger warning for sexual assault. Because throughout the, like, witch trial proceedings, obviously a lot of suspect men get the chance to poke at her naked. But also, when she is locked in her cell that night, awaiting hanging the next morning, because this is one of those fast-tracked witch trials where they don't even do, like, a test to check if you're a witch they just go yeah you're a witch and then they kill you the dude shows up to her cell he gets in using some of his leprechaun trickery and basically he tells her that he never loved her he tells her that she was just like a means to an end and a bunch of other things basically about how she was stupid if he thought if she thought that he was ever going to be with a woodbane throwing all those old prejudices right into her face when she's at her lowest ebb which is you know really classy and then he proceeds to basically lunge at her and kind of try and rape her and then she fights him off and he calls her some names and then he leaves which I felt was kind of extra like he was already being like a coward who just like used her and then wasn't you know strong enough to stand up and say that he'd cared about her or to take responsibility for his own actions I don't feel like he needed to be a rapist as well, but okay, book. Obviously, it's at this point that Rose is broken down enough and hurt enough to summon the Dark Wave. She puts together a little spell, which is quite a nice scene because she's just using things in the prison cell and her own wits to construct like an altar and to work a spell. And she basically sends a wave of destruction after the dude, Siobhan, everyone that they've ever met, like dishonour on you, dishonour on your cow, everyone. And she does this spell. And right at the end of it, she's so out of energy that she just collapses and sleeps through the night. And then the next day, the guards come and get her and they take her out to be hanged. And I was like, well, shit, seems like it's not looking good for her. But then... Her baby has to survive because Morgan exists, so there have to be descendants somehow. I was kind of confused as to how this was going to work. But it turns out not very many people have come to the hanging, and that is because most of them are dead. Because (laughs) during the night, Siobhan and the dude's village burned to the ground, as did the reverend who was there celebrating with them about having caught a witch. Um, A bunch of the townspeople are now too afraid to come outside because... They know she's a witch and the guards kind of don't have anyone telling them what to do and are also afraid of her. So she basically just says, feck off. And they're like, cool, off we will feck. Please don't curse us. Bye. And they leave. Now, this kind of, um, I felt like this was kind of a good way to get her out of that situation because I've always wondered, like, for this witch trials thing, like, if they actually caught a witch, like, if they actually caught a person with real life supernatural powers I mean you wouldn't be able to hold that person I mean I know that they believed like I mean the power of Christ will compel her to stay in this hole until we drag her out and like set her on fire but come on like who wouldn't be afraid of this person who wouldn't you know not want to evoke their ire so it was quite a nice to see a scene where they'd actually found a witch and that witch had been like well you're not going to kill me because I'm going to burn down your village so that was nice now At this point, quite gladdened by the fact that she's not being hanged from the neck until dead, Rose goes home to her mother and her mother completely disowns her for practising dark magic, for doing all this horrible stuff to, you know, Siobhan and the dude's village, which also included quite a number of largely innocent people. So Rose is feeling kind of bad about it as well, but she's justifying it to herself because she was protecting herself and her unborn child and also she was doing it for her fellow woodbanes who have been downtrodden at various points in the book we've seen um, them being victimized like people refusing to sell things at market to her because she's a woodbane people coming to steal um, people in the coven's sheep because they're woodbane then working baneful spells against them and their businesses because you guessed it they're woodbanes 
and they can't really do anything back because Sela, the uh, coven leader, has been very much, we will walk the path of light and they will do what they will do, but we will not stoop to their level, which is a good message, but it's not really going to help you get your sheep back. And also because if they step out of line, any one of those people can point at them and yell witch and it's like game over for them instantly. So Rose and her mum have a big falling out. Rose packs up her stuff and leaves. And as she is walking through the village, looking at the desolation that she caused with her spell, she meets up with a member of her mother's coven, who is one of the members who deserted because of Scylla's peace and love stance. And they invite Rose to be their new high priestess because she has a well-known connection to the goddess and a lot of power. And they want her to help them use the dark wave to basically enact revenge on anyone who's ever crossed a wood bane. And she says, go on then, I'll do it. Now, there's quite a lot of stuff there and quite a lot of things to unpack. It's quite a nuanced story in a way, because obviously the dark wave is the big evil of the book series. And yet here we are seeing it being created as a tool of justice almost because it's being used by someone who has been betrayed so badly and who has nothing to them except this power and only one way in which they can use it to preserve their own life. Now I feel like the epilogue kind of doesn't do that bit justice because it's basically just two pages of Morgan going I knew it I was born of evil which seems like she's skipped over the majority of the story and just read the massacre bit at the end because although she recognises that there are similarities between her and Rose and also between her mother and Rose because her mother was also kind of destroyed by love she doesn't really look at it in a sense of having learned and understood more about the nuance of people she still believes that coming from Woodbanes like her dad makes her evil and even knowing that her mum was part of a group of good Woodbanes doesn't really sway her back to the idea that you know it's up to everyone to decide whether they want to be good or evil so once again i feel like for all the good ideas and all the interesting plot lines the series has been let down by morgan and her stupidity because the epilogue doesn't really unpick that story as much as i was doing when i was reading it myself i am hoping that it gets unpicked more a little bit in the next book because obviously a lot of this book was given over to rose's story Maybe Morgan will react to it more in the previous book, you know, once she's done recapping everything that happened in books 1 to 12. Um, so I'm holding out hope that that will be the case and that hopefully we'll see some more of an idea of what it is, of what the real evil is in this world that's been created. Because it doesn't seem to be the woodbank, it doesn't seem to be the dark wave necessarily. It just seems to be specific people and I'm hoping that they can salvage that and not just kill all the baddies and call it a day. Because I've said before, the council also seems sketchy as hell and they also seem to be acting kind of like the other clans were in this book. So it'll be interesting to see where this goes. I have to say this is probably the best book in the series so far, uh, just because I think it was a lot better put together and the plot was a lot more interesting and not entirely predictable, which always gets a thumbs up from me. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. I hope you have enjoyed us going through the Wicker series so far. Do let me know if you've picked up a few copies, if you have read them, what you thought of them. Get in touch in the usual way. See the description box for details and I'll see you in the next episode. Bye!